So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's IDF Forum, the role of family and friends in chronic illness, creating a win-win situation. Before we begin, we have a quick disclaimer that the information presented during this event is not medical advice, nor it is intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical situation. So on behalf of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, welcome. Whether this is the first time you've attended an IDF forum or you have joined us before, we are honored to have you with us tonight. IDF's mission is to improve the diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life of people affected by primary immunodeficiency through fostering a community empowered by advocacy, education, and research. This means we are committed to serving you and providing you with the tools and resources needed to be your own best advocate and a champion for the PI community. IDF's vision, it is by offering these tools and resources that IDF can fulfill its mission of seeking to ensure that everyone in the US affected by PI has a fully informed understanding of the diagnosis that affects them, all available treatment options, the expected standards of care, all the opportunities for connection and support within the PI community. IDF forums are made possible by our wonderful sponsors. It is due to their partnerships and contributions that IDF is able to provide programs such as this one tonight and services to everyone in the PI community. Thank you to our 2021 sponsors, Core Services Leaders, CSL Bearing, Griffles, and Takeda, Core Services Supporter, Horizon Therapeutics and Octopharma, Core Services Sustainer, Acredo, Core Services Contributor, ADMA Biologics Bioproducts Laboratory, Farming Healthcare, and X4 Pharmaceuticals, National Patron, Patron Kedrion Biopharma, and community partner, Saleo Health. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Angela, who's gonna tell a little bit about an upcoming fun activity we have planned. Hey, Angela. Hey, Colleen. I'm so excited to be here tonight to share with you all about our IDF cooking class that we have. We are doing this cooking class as a part of our do-it-yourself fundraising platform. We wanna get the word out there that you too can make a difference just in yourself and how we want to show you how easy it is. So join us on Wednesday, August 4th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time, where we will have a live cooking class. We will be making a jalapeno basil lime martini. And of course you can make it a mocktail as well, a panzanella salad and full key lime ice cream. I know that sounds delicious. So just make sure that you join us. It's only $20 to attend. Um, and you'll have a great time. And don't worry if you can't cook. I cannot either, but I'm going to try my best. Um, thank you so much and have a great night and enjoy the rest of the forum. Thanks, Angela. You've made me hungry now. It sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. So right now I'd like to welcome and introduce Miss Rebecca Becky Wang. Miss Wang joins us from Michigan, where she is a mental health professional at Partners in Change. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Rebecca Wang. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, as Colleen said, I am Becky Wang. Uh, I am a native Michigander from Mount Pleasant, Michigan, which for those of you kind of familiar with the state of Michigan, it's sort of right in the middle here. Um, I am a lover of the beach and baseball and I'm so grateful to get some of both of those things in these days. I've been a licensed professional counselor for over 12 years now, um, and my profession is definitely part of my heart and soul. Um, I am the mom of two young men um, who aren't so young anymore. Uh, my youngest son is turning 18 later this year, and my oldest son is about to turn 20 next month. Um, I've been a member of the IDF family for 12 years, and so um, being invited to help all of you in these forums uh, means a great deal to me uh, along my journey with PI. 
So this is my connection to PI for those of you who uh, don't know. I see some familiar faces tonight and some new faces. I'm so excited all of you are here. Um, my connection to PI is my son, Christian. Uh, Christian is my youngest son, who is the one who's 17 and about to be a high school senior. Uh, Christian was born relatively ill within a couple of weeks. Uh, I was born and then a couple of weeks later, he got very sick. Uh, and five years later, he got a PI diagnosis through a lot of trials and tribulations like most of you are probably very familiar with. Um, and so uh, Christian was five when he was first diagnosed and has been on treatment ever since. And so we're very fortunate that Christian is able to be as normal of a young man as absolutely possible. Thank goodness for his medication and, and all the support that he receives. So um, because of this, and not only am I a mom to a patient living with PI, but being a therapist, I'm able to lend my tools and skills to folks who both are supporting those with PI and those living with it. And so um, there's my connection. So tonight we're going to talk about the benefits of friends and family involvement in chronic care. We're going to talk about and learn 10 important tips to be a good supporter. These tips are also very good for patients as well. So, but these might be something if you're a patient yourself, you might be able to share with those who love and support you. Um, and then most importantly, I think is just the opportunity to connect with each other. And again, mirror um, what uh, Austin from Takeda had just said and that we are, none of us are alone in this and that you have support. So caring for a loved one with a chronic condition can be profoundly fulfilling. Uh, as a mom to a young person, oh my gosh, there are days where, you know, we've been, we've had opportunities to connect with others or to help others, or we overcome challenges together. So it can be very fulfilling, but it can also be really daunting and emotionally and physically challenging and isolating at times. Interestingly enough, if you're a patient, I'm sure you feel the exact same way about living with a chronic illness. Overall, though, I think that it can lead to deeper and more meaningful relationships, but whether or not you're a patient or you're someone who loves a patient, um, it can lead to these more deeper, meaningful relationships with each other. And that's going to be the focus of tonight. How do we do that? So creating a win-win situation. Uh, a study back in 2009 revealed that 39% of those 44 and older with chronic conditions said they occasionally, rarely, or never get the help and support they need to manage their condition. That's a lot of folks out there who aren't feeling very supported. 70% of adults with chronic illness say they want to increase the support for their care that they receive from their family and friends. And family and friends have a remarkable potential to support patient self-management and medical care. If you're a patient and you have the support of loved ones um, there, you know how critical they are to your well-being and to your, you know, just kind of flourishing um, and living a fulfilling life. And so uh, part of the presentation tonight, we'll be talking about how do we have conversations with others that we care about to help and increase the support from those that we love. So this, the slide here talks about um, an overview of 10 tips to be a good supporter. Um, these tips, as I said earlier, also sort of overlap with how to be a good patient too. Um, and so it really talks about, you know, how do you work together with those who love and support you to have these win-win outcomes? So the first one is to become educated about PI. Um, most of you, if you're a patient living with PI, you, you know probably a lot about it, probably more than most. Um, what I've learned as a mom to a person with PI is that it seems like the knowledge is endless. Um, I'm always learning something uh, from either other patients, from other children, from the IDF staff, um, from other uh, people that I interact with. And knowledge is empowerment. So the more knowledge we have, the better able we are to advocate for ourselves. If you're a pay, if you're a caregiver or not even just a supporter, um, the more that you learn about the patient's condition, um, the more able you are to be able to help and to be supportive. 
Um, knowing that there are IDF resources out there for whether you're a patient, a caregiver, a supporter, um, there are all sorts of uh, written materials, printed materials, forums, as you're aware, presentations. Uh, the IDF has so many things to be to become more educated. Um, it also helps you connect with others in the community. Um, and no stupid, no question is a stupid question. Everything is important. Um, gosh, I think I learned most of what I know about PI because I asked so many questions to everyone I would encounter. I just wanted to know more and more. And so, you know, again, knowledge is power. And so the more you can become educated, um, the more informed patient you can be and supporter. So the next one is take care of yourself. Um, easier said than done sometimes, isn't it? Um, when I was brand new in graduate school to become a counselor, I will never forget, I had a professor who posed the question to the class of us and said, you know, if you've ever traveled on an airplane before, they give you the spiel before you take off about if the oxygen mask, when the oxygen mask comes down, um, you know, please put your own mask on before assisting others. And the professor shared that experience and said, how many of you would put your own mask on before you put it on, let's say your child or someone you were traveling with. And nobody in the classroom said they would do that. Everybody said they would put it on the other person first. Um, and we kind of looked at the professor like he was a little crazy for not for not agreeing with us. But he, he made a very valid point that if you aren't OK, if you haven't put your oxygen mask on first, you can't help someone else. Um, and so, you know, that really stuck with me as I'm telling that story, like 14 years later, that um, taking care of ourselves is absolutely essential, whether we're the patient or someone who loves the patient, it's absolutely critical to do that. And we're going to talk about some ways on how, how do you take care of yourself in the midst of all the stress that um, living with a chronic condition or loving someone with one uh, kind of creates for us. Part of that is um, don't shy away from telling others what you're experiencing, whether you're a patient or someone who loves a patient. It's important to be able to talk about what your experience is like. Uh, and so when we do that, I think there's power in sharing and power in our voice and in owning where we're at in the journey. Um, and obviously, don't neglect your own physical and emotional health, especially if you're a person who loves someone with a chronic illness. Um, I know a lot of times as a parent, um, there were times when I had my own physical health needs, but I, I always said, you know, I'll take care of that tomorrow. I'll do that next week. You know, my son seemed to have a need that I always placed before mine. Um, and pretty soon I was like, oh, shoot, like if I'm not taking care of my needs, how can I take care of his? Uh, and so don't neglect your own things, especially if you're, you're loving someone or caring for someone with a chronic illness. The next one is practice healthy living. Now, again, I know these things are a work in progress because I try my darndest on all of these things. And some days it's a win and other days, well, I say I'm going to try again tomorrow. But though what matters is that we try. So, you know, eating a healthy and balanced diet. Um, it doesn't, it's not rocket science. We don't have to eat every perfect food for us every day. But no matter where you're at in your journey, Maybe make just one conscious choice a day to say, you know, I'm going to have a banana for breakfast or, you know, I'm going to have some greens with my dinner or I'm going to have one less cookie today. You know, maybe just a small incremental change can really help you um, exercise regularly. The thing that about exercise, when I usually talk about it with groups of people, you know, they think I'm referring to going to run a 5K or, you know, doing some uh, massive amount of exercise. But this is you do what you can with where you're at. Right. And so if that's you'd have to do chair exercises in your living room or you take your dog or walk for a walk around the block at night, just a very gingerly stroll or Maybe you probably you like to do yoga. You can do that at home or somewhere else. So just something, incorporate some movement into your life. Uh, get enough sleep. Now, I have a little phone tracker that keeps track of my sleep. And I thought I was doing really well on this until my phone was like, oh, hey, guess what? You're really not getting enough. Most of us probably don't. 
And so the idea here is that, you know, we try to get some sort of restful sleep because sleep is where our brain and body does the repair work that it needs to continue to function. So sleep deprivation, if you've ever experienced that, um, not getting enough sleep, you know that not getting enough makes everything else worse. It makes our physical health worth and worse and it makes our mental health feel worse. Um, so sleep, it can't be understated. Um, and then get and stay involved with your own interests. It's very easy to get consumed by chronic illness, whether you're the patient or someone who loves a patient. Um, some days and sometimes it feels like it's taking up all of the space and all of the time. And some days it really does. But I challenge you to really think about, you know, what do you like to do? What would you like to do? Um, even if it's something like painting or maybe that cooking class with the IDF that they mentioned earlier. I'm so excited for that. Uh, I totally want to do that. Um, so, so even something like that helps you do a hobby related thing and, um, you know, kind of gets you out of that, you know, always thinking about chronic illness space. Staying social. This is so difficult with chronic illness and especially in a time when we have lived through the pandemic over the last uh, more than a year now. Um, you know, staying connected with others is so critically important. Um, I know that personally speaking from my experience, um, I, we never would have gotten to the place where we are without the IDF and the support and the connections that we've made through this remarkable group of people and patients along the way. Um, and so I've always, as I've had such a good blessing of being able to be at different conferences when we were able to have those in person and hearing other people's stories and, and connecting, it was always interesting to me because people, I would share my story and someone would say, oh my gosh, well, my child lives with this, but your story sounds so much worse. And, you know, everyone kind of had this perspective of, well, we don't, maybe we don't have it so bad. And, you know, everyone was able to sort of connect based on where they were in their own journeys. Um, but also, it's important to maintain other relationships in your life outside of the IDF, outside of the PI community. Um, sometimes those close relationships with friends or family, um, they, they tend to take a toll. Um, and so you want to make sure to try to foster some of those relationships if you're able to do that and find creative ways to get and stay connected. I think we've probably, because of the pandemic, all gotten a little more creative in the ways that we do connect with others, whether it's through Zoom or um, other uh, social media platforms. Um, we find ways to do that. Um, and work to not become isolated yourself, um, especially as a caregiver, even if the person that you love and support is more homebound. Um, it is important to try to get out once in a while, um, take care of yourself, um, even for patients too, even if that means just going to sit in your backyard for a little bit of time where you feel like you can be safe, or if you go to the park and sit for a little bit of time, anything, sometimes just to get out if you're able to do that. Accept help. This is such a tough one for a lot of folks, myself included. Um, and I've learned through the years that asking for and accepting help is a strength and not a weakness. Um, I share the story that uh, when I we were going through the process of diagnosis for my son, he was very small and I was in graduate school and oh my goodness, there were so many things happening and I felt this need to be super mom and super therapist and super student and all of the things. And I was running myself ragged and I couldn't be all the things for all the people who needed me. And I continuously had folks who were offering like, hey, I'm going to go to the grocery store. Do you want me to pick you up some milk or uh, can we bring you a casserole? And for so long, I was like, no, 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 I'm good. Uh, because I felt somehow felt at that time in my life that accepting their help would mean that I couldn't do it, that I wasn't somehow strong enough. Um, but I had a good friend who had the courage one day to speak up and say to me, do you realize when you don't allow us to help, you're robbing us of opportunities to feel needed and to feel wanted and to feel helpful in your life? Uh, and I never looked at it that way. Um, and she said to me, allowing us to help you is a gift that you give to us when in a situation where we feel helpless sometimes. 
And that really changed my point of view about accepting help. When I look at that, like it's a gift that I give to others who care about us to allow them to help in our lives. Um, it's really a beautiful thing. And, and my life got so much more fulfilled um, and my relationships deepened when I allowed others to help. Um, and like resist the urge to be that super supporter or that super patient who's like, I can do everything all by myself. I got this. I don't need any help. And that's really, really hard because there may be times when you have to do that. Um, but if there are others who want to help and support you or think that, or you think that they might invite them to, um, and that could help deepen your relationship. Acknowledge your emotions. So whether you're a patient or you're someone who loves a patient, um, if you're feeling hopeless or worthless or helpless, sad, anxious, or fearful, acknowledge these emotions. These are all so normal um, when either dealing with a chronic illness or loving someone who has one. Um, chances are you probably both feel similar emotions, maybe for the same reasons and maybe for some different reasons. You don't have to pretend that everything is like it used to be or that it's just fine. Uh, fine is one of those words that usually means I'm not fine at all. Um, and so we don't have to pretend like it is. Um, it's okay to say, you know what, I'm really struggling today. This is really hard. It is okay to acknowledge that. Allow yourself time to grieve any the losses that you might feel. If you're a patient, there's all sorts of losses that you might grieve. It might be, you know, the loss of uh, certain amounts of like just freedom to do certain things, or it might be the loss of, um, I don't know, maybe some important relationships in your life. As someone who loves a person with a chronic illness, you might have to grieve the relationship as it used to look because maybe your person isn't able to do the same things that they could before, or maybe they get tired a lot and they can't always go out and hang out anymore. Um, and so there's lots of losses in the process. And so allow yourself time to grieve them. And if you struggle, and even if you think you could use another person just to kind of bounce some things off of, to talk through the feelings and emotions, it's okay to seek help from a caring and trained mental health professional, such as a therapist or a social worker. Um, it's nice. It doesn't mean that anything's wrong or that there's a problem even. It might just be nice to have a person who understands, who can you can bounce some ideas off of and learn some new tools and skills. Allow for your healthy expression of feelings with one another. So just because you're a supporter does not take away the fact that you have a relationship with each other. Nurture it. It's the same thing if you have if you're a patient. Um, you know, you're not just the patient, you're not just the supporter, you have a relationship with one another outside of those roles. And so, you know, take time to remember what you love about those relationships that you have with others, um, and what's good about it outside of them helping and supporting. Um, don't be reluctant to share your difficulties with each other. A lot of times when I work with folks, uh, whether they're the, the person who's supporting a person with chronic illness or a person who has chronic illness, they're, both sides are usually very um, careful. They're like, I don't want to say that I'm really struggling with this aspect because I don't want to hurt the other person's feelings. Uh, and so what I've learned over time is that when both people are communicating honestly and kindly and directly, it really does help. Chances are you're both feeling similarly. Should difficulties arise, as I said, seek counseling. Um, anybody can go. Um, if you have a, a supporter or a loved one who could also use help, encourage them to go as well. You can also practice some healthy communication strategies. One of the favorites that I like to teach is I feel statements. I feel statements sound a lot like um, when you, you put when put the behavior in there, when they do something, I feel whatever emotion. And then you could say, I prefer what you'd prefer them to do. So for example, you might say, um, when you call my doctor's office um, to get information and you didn't ask me first about that, I feel frustrated. 
I'd prefer you talk to me for the information before calling my doctor's office. So what you're teaching them is, you know, what it is that they did that maybe bothered you um, or made you feel some emotion. You're pinpointing the exact emotion and then you're telling them what you'd prefer they do differently. Uh, this is a very direct way to communicate and it kind of sounds weird if you're not used to it. But what it does is it really helps get to the bottom of the issue for folks pretty fast. Um, in fact, my, my son often uses the I feel statements and he might say, um, mom, when you, uh, talk to my doctor about, I don't know, my new, the new medicine that I'm on, um, I felt, I think he told me he felt maybe, um, he, it wasn't quite an emotion, but he said he felt like I like went over, or, like did something without his permission. And so he said, um, I would prefer you include me in that conversation instead next time. And so I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm so sorry. I, I wasn't intending to like overstep. I was just trying to get that figured out for you. Um, absolutely. Next time I will for sure have you included in that conversation. So we were able to figure that out, but it was because we could be direct with one another. So I feel statements are one way to do that. So this will be in the PowerPoint and I get that this is kind of small, but what I put in here for you are a couple different slides that are family support techniques that are both linked to improved illness patient outcomes. And then also there's another slide on some things that, uh, some techniques that maybe aren't as helpful. So these might be great ones to share with the people that, um, that you love. And so the slide in front of you, these are support techniques that are linked to worse patient outcomes. So things you don't want to do or say, um, and they give you a, a list of examples like, um, you know, maybe saying things like you should go for a walk or, you know, you can't have that sandwich. Those things are very, they seem kind of controlling when they come out, even if you have good intentions, they might not land very well. Uh, another example they have here is, you know, I don't know why you stopped exercising last week. I just don't understand you. You might not get as much buy in when we communicate like that. So these are some things that we might want to um, steer away from. More importantly, on the previous slide, if you would go back one. These are some things that I want you to focus on. And these could be things as a patient that you could help and teach and model for others that are loving and supporting you. Um, these might be more helpful things to say. You might say something like, I know it's hard during the holidays to be around all that food that isn't recommended on your diet. So you're showing empathy for the person. Or you might say, you know what, I, I know it must be really difficult for you to not be able to, to enjoy an activity that you did because everyone's staying inside and wearing masks with the pandemic, right? That must be so isolating. Empathy, showing that you care. Um, showing concern. You might say, you seem really short of breath today. I'm really concerned about you. You might say, you might offer some choices. You might say, should we go for a walk this morning or this afternoon? Or do you want to help plan our menu for the week? These are all about giving choices. And so the, it's, I, it's not always about what we say, it's how we say it. And communication, I think, amongst patients and those who love patients is so critically important. Um, and so these are some really good kind of strategies here to focus on positive successes and to really work on trying to understand each other's point of view to create that win-win situation so that patients can get the support that they need and the supporters can feel like they're really being a good supporter. Um, you can encourage the healthy independence of your loved one. So as a person who loves someone with a chronic illness, it's so important to resist the urge to overfunction. Um, folks living with chronic illness have lots of abilities and there's lots of things that you all can do. Um, I know there have been times as a mom where I've just done certain things because I was trying to be helpful. Um, and it really takes away the power and control that a patient might have to take care of the things that they can do. Um, and so really walk that fine line. 
Um, empower your loved one, uh, whether you're the patient or someone who loves the patient, you can empower one another to make choices for their care. You can empower them to make healthy choices. You can empower them to be involved in your care to whatever degree you're comfortable or would want. Um, and to really just be a good supporter for one another. Um, assist your loved ones in finding their voice. Uh, I know that's something that a lot of patients struggle with. Like, where is my voice in this? Especially at times when it feels like chronic illness has taken away a lot of control. Um, it's important to find your voice. Um, and for those who love people with chronic illness, you know, how being able to help your loved one and be empowered and find that voice is so critically important. And then encourage children and young adults to make decisions in their care. Uh, I know we've talked a lot about adults living with chronic illness, but um, children uh, live with it just as much. And, you know, it's so important that we allow them, even at young ages, to be able to make some decisions in their care where appropriate. Uh, when my son was very little, sometimes it might be, do you want your IV in, in your hand or your arm? Do you want it in your left arm or your right arm? Um, do you want the purple sticker or the pink sticker, um, you know, just any choice that you can give children um, it, to empower them really does help. And again, I know I've said this multiple times, but it is so critically important to reach out um, and to seek that help and support. You are absolutely not alone in this. Um, I absolutely love participating in these forums because it is such a great reminder that, you know, you all are connected in this way. We all are connected and you are certainly not alone. Uh, the IDF, as you know, have so many resources and so many cool things to participate in. Um, the conference next week, uh, which I'll also be participating in, I can't wait for that. Such good opportunities. Um, you might even be able to locate uh, a local support group for uh, caregivers or for uh, friends and family who are supporting those with chronic illness. Uh, there are many that you might even be able to find online these days. And then, of course, reach out and seek professional help. Um, almost any place nowadays has therapists that you can pretty easily access, even if it's via teletherapy on the computer. Um, more and more mental health professionals are providing service to people that way because it's most convenient and it's safer for a lot of patients like you all. Um, so please reach out. And if I can ever be of a support and assistance to you in doing that or helping to connect you with someone in your state, I'd be more than happy to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Becky. That was amazing. We really appreciate you volunteering all the time it took to put this together and being here tonight. And we are going to enter our Q&A session. So Becky, I have some interesting questions. One of the questions I have is, do you have any special tips for siblings of a child with PI? How much should the parents share as to what is wrong with the child and how should the, how involved should the siblings be in the care of that child? Oh, that's a really great question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a, gosh, that's wonderful. Um, I, I think that the siblings of patients with PI often sometimes get left out of the equation. And so I love that this addresses, you know, how best to help them and how they can be involved. Um, I'll speak from a personal, my personal experience and kind of integrate my professional experience as well. Um, I think, first of all, it's dependent on the age of the sibling. So what you're going to share about the chronic illness is probably very age dependent, of course. Um, and so, you know, I think even to this day, I, you know, my oldest son who's 20, who doesn't have PI, I think he kind of knows the basics about his brother's illness, you know, and that's pretty much, he's able to look and we've explained the more in-depth version, but it's for us, it had been easiest to just say, you know, he doesn't make antibodies the same way most people do. And so he has difficulty fighting off infection. And then that means that he gets sick more than most people. And when he does get sick, 
that means that he oftentimes needs more medical intervention than your average person. And so that's pretty much what my older son, who's now 20, kind of knows about it. And he's good with that. Now, at the time when he was younger, I remember him saying to me, he was very worried about his brother or something terrible happened to his brother medically. And so we were trying to protect him from some of the information because it was a lot and we were learning too. But in that process, at least for my son, he expressed worry that he was afraid something was going to happen to his brother. And so at that point, we, we explained to him that no, he is seeing his doctors and he's being treated and that he, he's okay and he's safe. And so I wouldn't have even, that wouldn't have even crossed my mind as a thought my older son was having unless he voiced that. So I think it's so critical. I'm a big proponent of talking to your kiddos uh, and your family members about what's going on in age appropriate ways um, and seeing what both the patient living with PI is comfortable with involving their sibling in. Um, I know that when my son was a little bit younger and he would do his sub-Q infusions at home, he was really okay with his brother helping out. And so we would let my older son, with my younger son's permission, like do some of the infusion process with us. Um, and then he could see what was happening and he wasn't scared of it. Um, and so you might be able to involve um, your other kids in the process, even if it's um, you know, taking the tops off the vials or like wiping the counter off or, um, I don't know, just some part of the process, putting a Band-Aid on um, just so that they can have some level of involvement. Or maybe it's, you know, when the infusion gets going or when you're doing your infusion, you have a movie, kind of a movie time for all of you where you just kind of sit and relax and bond. And so, you know, I think involving that sibling as much as, as they want to be involved, um, offering opportunity for that and letting the sibling kind of go at their pace, uh, of course, with permission of the patient. I think that's really important too, to allow the patient to be empowered as well. Another question, are there therapists that specialize with patients with chronic illness and how do people find them? That's a really wonderful question too. Um, I don't think that there's necessarily a specific specialty. However, many therapists that I know, myself included, um, have some passion for working with patients uh, with chronic illness, probably because we've lived with it in some way or love someone who does. And so many of us have taken specialty courses and maybe some people have gotten certifications uh, to help folks living with chronic illness and their families. And so there are many of us therapists in the world who this is a real passion area for us and we really just want to help. Um, one of the ways that you can find a therapist who has some specialty in this area um, the, one of the most reputable websites you can go to is psychologytoday.com. Um, on psychologytoday.com, there is a, a therapist finder, and you can put in your zip code where you're located. And then you can, there's also some boxes where you can check what, what kind of parameters you'd like. You can choose a male or female therapist. You could choose... Uh, somebody who has a specialty in chronic illness, let's say, and lots of other things. And you can narrow down. Um, you can even put in what kind of insurance you might have. Um, and that's a great way to narrow it down for sure. Thank you. This question, the next one hits home with me. Um, as a mother with two children with CVID, I can relate to this mom's question. Any advice for the mom that is dealing with two children with PI? Because it's exhausting. Absolutely, it is incredibly exhausting. Uh, <laughs> I, I can relate and empathize with that so much. Um, my biggest advice for you is to take care of yourself. Um, you can't pour from an empty cup. And I know that sounds so counterintuitive because as a mom, you're giving, giving, giving. And sometimes the care of the ones you love consumes every minute of the day. But even if it's five minutes at the end of your day to just decompress, to paint your nails, to take a hot shower, uh, whatever that might be, carve out five minutes for yourself. Um, because what I know is that if you're not good, nobody else is going to be good. Um, and one of the most important lessons that we learned early on in our journey was that 
the less we functioned well and the less we as parents took care of ourselves, the more that our children struggled. Um, and so the better job we did at taking care of us, the better job that our children coped as well. And so it just can't be understated, even if it's five minutes, you know, five minutes. And I think finally, you know, you're doing a good job. You are doing the best you can. There's not a mom with a person with chronic illness that I know that can't say they're doing the best they can. Um, and so, you know, just remember that even on the hard days when you don't feel like you have one more ounce to give or you feel like you didn't do anything that was good or that you wanted to accomplish. No, you are you are killing it. You are doing the best you can and you've got support out there. Thanks. So at the other end, how do I get my wife to understand that sometimes I just need a break and I need to go off and do something by myself, but I'm not running away from her and I'm not angry at her, but I just need some time for me and an and escape from dealing with all of the issues. That's a really good point. And I like the distinction of, you know, I need some space and I need some time for me to process as opposed to I'm not running away from you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that might be a very important thing to be able to communicate if you haven't done so already. Um, you know, sometimes if we don't have these hard conversations, it can be interpreted in lots of different ways. Um, and so you might say, you know, I'm not, I'm not at all running away, but I do need some time to just process my own thoughts. And maybe I do that better in quiet or when, you know, I take a walk. Um, you know, the other part of that is I think about how humans in general recharge their batteries at the end of a day, anybody. Um, and so, you know, usually we talk about this in terms of people being extroverted or introverted. Extroverts typically recharge their batteries after a long day by hanging out with people and uh, people think I'm a little crazy sometimes because I'm super extroverted and I can work 15 hours in a day and I want to come home and like go to dinner with my friends because that fills me up and energizes me and recharges. Now I have friends who if they work that same day going out with their friends after work would be horrible. Like they just want to go for a walk. They just need time alone. They just need to watch mindless TV to kind of check out for a bit. And that's how they recharge. So maybe if you talked about it in that way, like I'm re recharging my batteries by unplugging a little bit and it has nothing to do with you, the patient at all. Um, and it's good for everyone's mental health to do that because you can be a better supporter when you've done the self care that you need. Thank you. So another question is, how do I explain to my family and or friends that I'm tired and I'm having issues that they can't see because they don't believe there's anything wrong with me. They think I'm just nagging or I, I'm just, you know, lazy and whatever, but how PI patients look normal. We, we don't have a cast. We don't have a, a, a limb that's missing that shows people that we're struggling. So how do we explain to family and friends that our exhaustion, our not feeling good, our reason for not being able to attend a party that everybody's going to is legit? That's oh, another great question too. And I know that that's something probably most, if not all of you experience, you know, those, this idea of like an invisible illness, like we look okay on the outside a lot of times, but you know, our immune system doesn't function the way that it should. And it causes us all sorts of problems. And so, um, you know, one of the ways that I have done that in the past is I'll get out some of the IDF materials, even if they're the ones that are geared more toward children sometimes, um, even a zebra tail, that's one of my favorites. And I share with people um, even such a simple story because it kind of illustrates what it is that you're going through. Um, you know, Colleen, you brought up like, you know, we're not, you're not wearing a cast that might say, oh, hey, like I need some help. I've got a broken arm. You can't see the invisible illness. But um, I would also say that you might give the example of you can't necessarily see diabetes either. Mm -hmm. But if you're a person living with diabetes, 
you can't see that on the outside always, but you still need help and you're still going to struggle at times. Um, and I think it is about education and you know, helping to educate others about your illness. And so whatever it is that you live with, making sure that you're knowledgeable so that you can explain it to them, um, that you can't see it on the outside. It's how your immune system is not functioning on the inside. Um, and because of that, it causes you to feel whatever symptoms you're experiencing. Um, and so, you know, again, open communication is so important. You might set it up to say to someone, you know, there might be days where I'm really wiped out and as much as I'd want to go out, I just can't. Um, and I hope you'll, I hope you'll be okay with that. And then there might be other days where you're feeling super great um, and you can. I don't know if any of you have heard kind of the spoon analogy, but it's like we wake up, everybody kind of wakes up with a, the same number of spoons every day. You know, maybe you start with 10 um, and the spoons are sort of equivalent to what you give your energy to. So if you start your day with 10 spoons and you wake up and you take a shower, that took two spoons. So now you only have eight left and you're trying to figure out in the course of a day where to allot your eight spoons. When your eight spoons are gone, you don't have any more to give. And so maybe that means you've got to rest before you can get more spoons the next day. Um, there's actually something called the spoon theory uh, and you can look that up online. And I, I kind of like the idea that no one gets an infinite number of spoons. All of us only have a certain amount, some of us fewer than others. And when they're gone, they're gone. Um, and you can't get any more until sometimes the next day or until you're feeling better. And so explaining it kind of with that example, I've actually had patients get out a number of spoons like and put them out. And when they did an exercise or an activity or something during their day that just took a lot of energy and they didn't have more, they, they put the spoon away. And it was a visual way to sort of show like it's only noon and I don't have any spoons left. Um, and so it's a great way to be able to show people like, you know, sometimes you're just done and there might be other days when you can do it. Um, but again, having those conversations, talking, being honest about that. Um, and many will understand and there may be some that don't, but it's OK because you have to take care of yourself first and foremost. Yeah, I like the spoon thing. Is that something that children can learn? And maybe set spoons out in the morning to explain to parents, maybe kids who are younger that can't really verbalize, I'm exhausted, but utilize that method. And how would they do that? How would a parent teach that? Sure. Um, that's a good question. I've actually used this with kiddos in a variety of ways, um, but this is another application of it. You know, I think just it's simple, like to get out even 10 spoons and say, OK, you start your day with 10 spoons. And so we're going to you can take away one spoon every time you're feeling maybe it's an emotion. Maybe it's not even a physical feeling. Maybe you're just feeling really, really, really sad or really, really, really angry. And a lot of your energy goes there. So you can take away a spoon. Um, and so as a parent or as somebody who loves a, a child or a patient, with that, you might say, oh my gosh, we started with 10 and now we're down to three spoons. You must be really nearing the end. What can we do to help you get more spoons? Or do we need to rest? Or what do we need to do? You could use it in, I think, a variety of ways to try to help be that visual. Um, and it can also, I think it could help children explain, like once they get down to low spoons, once they learn the concept, they might be able to self-identify um, okay, I'm running low on spoons. I should probably rest now. Um, or I probably need to take a time out and just chill out or go do something that's low key today. Or maybe I need to take a nap or something like that. You know, I think it's easy. Like you could easily adapt it. I think that would be a good thing too for siblings to see. Mm -hmm. And I think been... siblings could do it in the same way. Because um, every single person, whether you have a chronic illness or not, we all start with some number of spoons. And when we're done, we're done. <laughs> um, and so some of us go through our spoons faster than others. Some days I go through my spoons faster, just depending on what I've got going on. But I know that when I'm getting down to like two spoons left, that's my clue that it's time to, to do some self-care or to check out for the night or something like that. Well, Becky, I really appreciate it. And I thank everybody for their questions. And I hope you have received a lot of help and advice in moving forward. 
So I want to thank you again for being here and thank you for all your wisdom. Once again, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you found the information tonight to be helpful. And please remember, IDF is here for you every step of the way on your journey. And hopefully we will see you this week at the PI conference. So good night, everybody. And thank you.